But the building of trust is is a process and it is something that needs to be worked on daily. It's something that most or, or many times is taken for granted. And, uh, and I think for me, I, the best description I have about building trust or the process that you need to go through in order to maintain, maintain trust is this notion of waves on a beach, right? The waves are constant. They chip away at those rocks of distrust and of mistrust. And over the, in the fullness of time, you get fine, beautiful sand that everybody wants to rub their toes into. And I think the building of trust at the local level is a lot like that. It's through performance and it's through, and it, it is a function of the time that you're there and, and the, and the achievements that you, uh, that you fulfill on behalf of the community. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown. In this episode, we are taking a deep dive into the critical issue of local mayors and councillors earning and keeping trust in local government. Today, we have an esteemed panel of experts who will be sharing their insights and perspectives on this critical topic. Our guests today include Keith Comstock, the executive in residence at the Johnson Sioma Graduate School of Public Policy, Malcolm Eaton, a municipal contractor and past mayor of Humboldt, Saskatchewan, and Ben Perlou, president of Catalyst Communications. As we all know, trust is the foundation of any relationship, and that holds true for the relationship between local elected leaders and residents. So, how do local mayors and councillors earn and keep the trust of their communities? What steps can they take to ensure transparency and accountability? And what role does communication play in building and maintaining trust within the community? These are just some of the questions we will be exploring today with our esteemed panel. We have lots to unpack in this episode as we delve into the critical issue of local elected leaders earning and keeping trust in local government. So let's get started. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, gentlemen. I want to start with my first question. I'm going to pose this to the former politician in the group first, and then I'm going to get everyone's opinion on this exact question. And this is the first question I sent you, and that is, how would you define trust in the context of local government? So Malcolm, can you take that question first? Sure, happy to. Uh, so to me, this is uh, really about confidence, and uh, it's it's the community having confidence that you're going to be acting and making decisions in the best interest of the community at large. So uh, and to me, it's it's that simple. It boils down to the fact that the community has confidence in you. Uh, that you're going to be doing the right things for the right reasons. And, uh, you know, assuming the community knows you well because uh, you've been involved in the community, perhaps uh, leading up to uh, being elected to a council and, and those kind of things. So uh, you have a sense that the community has some level of confidence in your ability to make good decisions uh, on behalf of the community and in the best interests of the community as a whole. Ben, what about yourself? How would you define trust in the context of local government? Yeah, I think Malcolm hit the, the nail on the head there. Um, it, it's about, from the elected official side, the, the community believing that they're making decisions in the best interest of the full community um, and, and with all the information available to them. And then on the other side of it, uh, on the service delivery side, it's just that trust that, hey, our garbage is going to be picked up and our parks are going to be cleaned. And sometimes... That can seem somewhat trivial, but uh, but people put a lot of stock into that. And so it's a big part of it. And what about yourself, Keith? Last word on this before we start the open discussion here. I agree with what Ben and Malcolm have offered here. I would add two other elements. One is, a, is an understanding, a general understanding amongst the general populace about what the goals, objectives, and priorities of your elected leaders and their administration are. 
And, this, and the third component, in addition to confidence and a real good understanding, is the opportunity to be engaged and to be able to participate in the in the workings of the municipality that they live in. So, you know, trust is a is a multifaceted concept, and and uh, I think for me at least, those three attributes sum it up. Now, this this discussion, this roundtable was spawned from my recent trip to SUMA, the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association Conference in Saskatoon in April. And when I was talking to mayors and councillors, trust was one of the things that came up over and over again. And the issue is the building of trust, because right now you say the word politician, I'm your mayor, I'm your counselor. There's an automatic uh, idea that you can't trust that person. You can't understand or believe what they're about to tell you. And I want to know what are some of the factors that counselors, mayors can work towards to build that trust that sometimes can be seen as not there. Ben, let's start with you. I think a big part of it stems from the fact that for local government, residents don't actually have any clue what's happening. They don't know what local government does, let alone what council's up to. Um, you know, as much as local government is the most impactful in everybody's everyday life, people are more aware of what happens at the provincial level, the federal level. And, and so immediately there's a barrier. Um, and, and so for me, it's about breaking down that barrier. If the, the council members are able to connect with the community and and work in a way that puts them in front of residents to answer some of uh, of the the questions that may come across as ignorance then it begins begins to build that bridge um there was a, a community i worked with where residents were losing their minds because the utility rate went up again they had the highest utility rate in, in the province and eventually council held a town hall where the question came up immediately and, and the mayor was able to say hold up we're in an area that's too cold to have any sort of reservoir. So we have to bring all of our water in and everything that we have is uphill. So we have to have stations to pump it uphill here, here, and here. And this is why it costs more. Here's the cost associated with each station. And as soon as you start doing those pieces, residents are able to say, oh, I'm still not happy about it, but I understand. And that's the biggest piece to me is building an understanding of what local government does and why it operates the way that it does. I'm going to ask a very stupid question right now before Malcolm jumps in. And I want to get Malcolm's opinion on this because he's the former mayor of a town in Saskatchewan. Are people oblivious on what municipal municipalities do or are they apathetic on what municipalities do? Do people just not care when it comes to what a municipality does? And does that hurt building that trust scenario when people would rather care about what Justin Trudeau, Trudeau is doing or Danielle Smith or Scott Moe are doing in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And when it comes to their mayor, as long as I don't see a big bill that's uh, on my taxes or on my water bill, I just don't care what the municipality is doing. Interesting. Yes. Uh, well, what I was going to follow up with was uh, sort of the notion of uh, I agree there's an element of apathy there. And uh, following up to uh, Ben's comments, uh, you know, the other part of it is people are interested uh, when it affects them. So if you get up in the morning to flush the toilet and there's no water, uh, you're, you're very interested in what's going on. Uh, but, but I think we did an exercise several years ago at which we listed all of the programs and services that we as a municipality provide. And, uh, you know, the staff was very engaged in this. It was part of a budgeting process. It was uh, a very interesting exercise. For council, it was a fascinating exercise to look at all of the different things that we do, what we pay for, what we have staff doing, what we what we spend money on, basically, uh, a phenomenal list. Uh, and, and I, the community is not always fully aware of, of what we do. And I think that's a challenge for us uh, in the municipal sector is to really get our, our communities to understand the day-to-day -day things that affect them. Because what goes on in a municipality, in a town, a village, or a small city, or a big city, uh, those things affect people in the morning when they get up to flush the toilet. What goes on in Regina, 
uh, in the legislature or in Ottawa in the parliament, way far removed from the daily life of uh, people in the community. So um, I think there's an element of apathy, uh, but I think we're also distracted. I never saw myself as a politician. I saw myself as somebody who wanted to be very involved in the community and uh, being on council was a natural step. Uh, I didn't consider myself as a politician. So I, I've never enjoyed being referred to as a politician in the municipal world. I'm going to challenge you on that for one quick second here, Malcolm, because you, I, I heard, I've heard that a lot of times from municipal politicians. They don't like being called politicians because there's a context that you get called a politician, you're automatically going to lie to your residents or your constituents. But you are elected. You are an elected official. And with that becomes the word politician attached to it. So is it the mindset that even politicians understand that if I get called to politicians, people are automatically going to assume that I'm lying to them, I'm being untruthful to them, and I'm not uh, working in the best interest that the context of it or the idea that a politician is only in it for themselves? Yeah, if you want my <laughs> response, I know exactly what you're saying, <laughs> uh, and and I don't disagree. I just uh, uh, I just didn't see myself as a politician in in those terms. Uh, I didn't want to be part of that club. I wanted to be seen as the person in the community, uh, and I wanted my council members to be seen as people in the community who are really interested in the community. And partisan politics is not part of our world. Uh, uh, so um, in the bigger world of what goes on in provincial politics and federal politics, it, 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 that's a different world than our municipal world, although we're certainly affected by it. Keith, I'm going to throw it over to you for a second, because I want to know on the flip side of this, what is what are some of the factors that can contribute uh, municipal governments and local elected leaders, I won't use the word politicians for Malcolm's sake, uh, in losing trust. And what do you see in your role uh, as one of the biggest things that municipal elected officials need to work on to overcome that sort of pitfall that comes with losing trust in municipal government? Yeah, I think for me, maintaining and building trust as an institution or as a municipal government works exactly the same way that you build or maintain trust as an individual. You know, when you think about somebody that you trust, somebody that, you know, that, that you might even trust your life with, uh, those attributes are consistency and they do what they say and they say what they're going to do and they follow up. And, and, and there's a, there's a scrupulous attention given to being honest and above board. So for me, some of those things, the flip side of those things are what, uh, are what uh, erodes trust. I also believe that uh, the intrusion of partisan politics, as Malcolm has already mentioned, into local government is becoming more, more prevalent in, uh, in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. I'm not sure I like it. Uh, I'm not even sure what to do about it, but I know it, it's becoming more prevalent. But the two most, uh, the two most important things that I want to make here is, is on the side of professional development. It's really difficult to be an effective governor or have effective governance at the local level if you don't know what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And I've always felt it was decidedly unfair that we elect good meaning and goodwill people at the local level and and put them in charge of these multi-million dollar corporations and say, good luck, God bless, let us know how that turns out. Uh, so the, the lack in both, uh, in, in most Western democracies of not having some sort of preparatory or required work that people need to go through or a set of skills that they need to need to go through and need to embrace in order to become effective governors uh, is probably the one of the biggest things that contributes to losing trust. They just don't know how to do it. Yeah, I, it's interesting because Alberta has legislation that says, hey, you have to do a governance orientation if you're elected. Not every province does, every province should. Um, but there's no guidelines as to what that actually looks like. And so 
Sometimes that is a half day session on governance. Sometimes it's a full day and, and sometimes it's council drinking out of a fire hose and they're going to forget because it's too much coming at them at once anyway. Um, and in other municipalities, it's the CAO talking for an hour. And so it, it there, there needs to be some consistency. And I, I think you've made raised an important point that when we talk with elected officials, it's very rare that a year or two into their job, it's the job that they thought it was going to be. Yeah, I agree 100% there. When I was first elected, our, our elections happened in October. Well, guess what happens? Guess what you're doing in November? You're budgeting multi million dollar level budget and uh, I'm into budgeting within within weeks uh, very very difficult process and that and and the whole financial planning and budgeting it is one of the most important things we do as elected officials looking after those special resources we have available from our citizens through taxes and, and grants and fees for service and so on and so forth so uh, that was very disconcerting for me as a, at the beginning. I knew not what questions to ask. I knew it, the language, the format of the budget, everything was new and different to me. I'm going to ask a very weird question right now, and I want to pose this to all three, and I want to start with Keith. Should politicians, locally elected leaders, expect to have the trust of their community the day after the election or should they work to earn that trust from their residents because i'm assuming if i'm just elected i believe i have the trust and the confidence of the community that has just put me in this office should they assume that or should they start fresh on day one and just work towards earning the trust of the community, even though they've just been elected. So I want to start with Keith on this because I want to end on Malcolm because I feel like he has some very big confidence and very big uh, words that he wants to say on this. So Keith, let's start with you on that question. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Listen, uh, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, and by that, I mean, I think it's reasonable for our locally elected politicians, any politician for that matters, to assume that they have the trust and the and the faith or at least the name recognition of the people that voted them that allowed them to take office in the first place. So I, I, I think that's a positive that you can walk into the job saying, OK, well, you know what? There's at least enough people out there who have enough faith in me to do this job that I got elected. But the building of trust is is a process and it is something that needs to be worked on daily it's something that most or, or many times is taken for granted and uh, and i think for me i the best description i have about building trust or the process that you need to go through in order to maintain maintain trust is this notion of waves on a beach right the waves are constant they chip away at those rocks of distrust and of mistrust and over the in the fullness of time you get fine beautiful sand that everybody wants to rub their toes into and i think the building of trust at the local level is a lot like that it's through performance and it's through and it, it is a function of the time that you're there and and the and the achievements that you uh, that you fulfill on behalf of the community Ben, what's your thoughts on that? And uh, I, I want to actually... add a caveat into your question <laughs> as well, because we're talking about building trust with the community, but there's also another aspect we haven't talked about, and I want to throw it in here right now, building trust around the council table as well, because you have to trust your fellow councillors or even the mayor or the Reeve that you will all work in unison. You may not agree on everything, but there has to be trust that you can speak openly and honest with your fellow counselors on issues you disagree with. So is that trust expected when you first get elected as counselor or is it earned? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to it's earned every day. I, I think that Keith, I like that actually analogy of the, uh, the waves hitting. Um, I, to me, the election is you did a good job at the at the interview stage and you've gotten the job now you have to prove yourself daily and that's to residents that's to other council members that's to administration really um you know it, it, as an elected member you're setting the tone for the community and so engage in a respectful manner do your research vote on behalf of the full community and not you know your your own inklings or, or a, a subsect of the community and that's where trust is built over time it, it's just putting in the work um it, 
when elected members are, are voted for, it's not because they understand procedural bylaws. It's not because they know all the decisions that are going to be put in front of them. It's because they're, they're considered to be of integrity and, and somebody who can represent the community. doesn't mean that they're 100% going to. So you still have to work on that. And in, depending on the system that you're in, that can change quite a bit. If you're in an at-large system, the person who got the most votes and the person who squeezed through with the least votes can still be on council and their vote matters the same. And so that's where council members have to start throwing away their egos. Um, you know, in a ward system or a division system, you'll have a councillor that wasn't, or a candidate that wasn't elected in one ward who had more votes than the winner in the other ward. Um, in Ontario, where they have two tier systems of government, where, where you represent at the local level and at the county level in some areas, that's a whole different thing. So you, you really are building trust across the board three ways, outward, around the table, and then up to administration as well. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate uh, uh, what you fellows are saying, and I, I don't disagree with anything you said. And I, I like the notion that you've presented this as a job because I've always viewed it like that. It's like I applied for this job to be on council and uh, I, I submitted a resume. I submitted a whole bunch of information over a period of time uh, to a, a panel that was interviewing me, so to speak, and then I was hired to do the job. So I, I would hope that uh, everybody who's elected to a council has an element, the communities has an element of confidence and trust in them at the beginning. However, once you get together as a council, does the community trust you and have confidence in you as a council, as well as you as individuals on the council? So I think the point about functioning as a council and earning the community's trust as a council is a really important piece, as well as that individual piece. And yes, I think it's every day you're working towards that. And I think it's part of our job as elected officials is to make sure not just at a council meeting, but through our involvement in the community, our interactions with the residents of the community that we're building and earning that trust all the time. I'm going to pose this question to Ben because he's the communications expert here. And I want to talk about social media here for a few seconds. Social media has changed the name of the game when it comes to local politics and local government. And you can you can work till you're blue in the face to earn the trust of your residents of your community, but social media has changed the way that trust is earned. Because if you're not responding to people on a constant basis on social media, if you're not on those rants and raves uh, uh, Facebook pages, you are losing a subsect of your community that don't want to interact one on one or in person. How does social media play into building trust in a local environment? Uh, less than it did three years ago and less than it did five years ago before that. Um, social media is a tool, but it's one of many tools. And the input that you receive from residents through social media is, a, again, it's a subsect of the population. So on Twitter, you'll get an angry minority that's very passionate about something that may be representative of the community. It may not be. And so to put too much weight into social media is a, a dangerous approach. Um, the impacts that social media ha can have are uh, are far reaching though. Um, there's a, a municipality I did a, a session with on media relations because they had a council member who tweeted out anti-vax, anti-mask rhetoric during the pandemic, uh, which was picked up as part of a national story on the difference between rural council members and urban council members in how they were talking about COVID. Um, it painted the entire community with that anti-vax, anti-mask uh, framing, regardless of the fact that this was the only member on council that was pushing out that information. And the community lost an investment of tens of millions of dollars from industry that was considering them in one other area to locate. And that was sort of the nail in the coffin. When that story came out, they went, we just can't be associated with this right now. So one tweet or a series of tweets had the impact of losing over $20 million um, for, for a community that could have very much benefited from $20 million. So when you look at it from that perspective, the, the risk of engaging too much on, on social media is higher than the risk of 
engaging less on social media. Um, and I also am a big advocate for, you know, use it, use it as a tool, get information out there, echo the municipality's messaging, the organization's messaging, but get in front of people and have human conversations because that's going to have a lot more impact and be more meaningful than somebody typing from behind a screen regardless. Malcolm, what about yourself? In the role of social media in 2023, has it changed the way that politicians or local elected leaders build that trust with their residents or even the stakeholders in other communities? Like Ben said, businesses who are looking to attract, is social media the way that you have to try and build the trust as well? You know, I I, I really appreciate Ben's comments because I, I, I I'm not sure um, you know, I'm not actively engaged in social media as a member of a council, but my advice when I've been asked uh, has been to say, if you're going to be on social media, you need to be monitoring it constantly as an individual, and the same is true for the municipality. If, if you think you can just throw out bits of information and not be monitoring what the responses are, et cetera. And, it, and I think for a municipality and in individuals on council, you need to recognize that uh, people wide and far are looking at this. In my case, in the community of Humboldt, I've, I've viewed Humboldt's Facebook page to be Humboldt's. And if there's stuff on there that's detrimental to our community, it needs to be cleaned up immediately because I don't want an investor on the other side of the country, looking at our community as a potential investment site and seeing a bunch of stuff that isn't appropriate or isn't true. So I think that's an important piece. You need to really monitor this stuff. But I really agree with Ben's point, you know, that it's only one tool and, and it's maybe a smaller tool in the toolbox than, uh, than some people think. Uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of other tools. So let's get out there and, and connect with the community. Um, you know, I like coffee and I like going and having coffee with people. And, and lots of people say, you know, Coffee Row is a horrible place to go. There's all kinds of stuff goes on in Coffee Row. It's a great place to be when you're an elected official of a municipality because you hear lots of interesting stuff and you get asked some questions, but you're engaged face to face with people and, and you build relationships. Uh, uh, so I, I, I enjoyed going out for coffee. I wasn't afraid of coffee row. I wasn't afraid of hanging out at the rink or hanging out in those kind of places either uh, because that's a place where you can really face to face engage with people a lot. So Keith, uh, we, we talk about social media not being one of the, it being a tool in the toolbox, but there are other ones. What should local elected leaders focus their time and energy on more than these smaller tools in the toolbox to make sure that there is earned trust between residents, between stakeholders, between even council members? Is it just the traditional one-on-one -on -one in-person meet and greets or the one-on-one -on -one coffee dates that Malcolm loved when he was the mayor? I think that the certainly Ben's and, and Malcolm's comments about social media uh, are appropriate. The rose-colored glasses are off social media. I think many communities and, and even businesses thought of social media as being this marvelous tool that was going to solve all of our problems. And it was, wasn't it going to be great to have this, this reach into everyone's living rooms or into everyone's phones, depending on how you look at it. And that's just not the case. For me, rather than trying to identify uh, one or two or three things that, that local politicians are, ought to concentrate on, uh, because I don't think it's the same in every community. I go back to my concrete sequential mother was a teacher way of looking at things. Uh, and I know Malcolm will, will nod his head in uh, being uh, you know, a former principal in his own professional life as well. You communicate for a reason. You don't communicate just for the per, you know, ju just for just to say you've done it. I always counsel uh, that uh, you need to have you need to pay attention to the five W's when you design your communications plan, no matter what it is. Who are we going to talk to? What are we going to talk to them about? When are we going to talk to them? 
uh, what sort of a platform or a vehicle we'll use to get the message to them and why are we communicating? I think it's the why that's missing most of the time, not only in social media, but just in communications in general at the municipal level. I always believe that every time you have a communications activity, no matter what, it is in support of a big project or in support of a new announcement, it is a two-way process. You are communicating with your electorate for the purpose of it. And you are also communicating because you expect to get something back. And if you and if you haven't taken those sorts of elements into consideration, you're doomed. The last point I'll make on this is that with is with respect to social media in particular, most of the issues that I've seen or that I've heard of arising out is because there aren't strong policies and procedures around the use of social media. Who monitors the account? Who gets to contribute to it? Uh, what do councillors, uh, what are the expectations of council members with respect to their own personal accounts, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or whatever? It's always easier to anticipate the problems that might arise when the bullets are not flying. If you wait until the disaster happens, it's too late. The horse is out of the barn. Use whatever cliche you like, uh, and, and you're going to find trouble. I'm going to let Ben or Malcolm jump in on that before I ask my next question, because you were both nodding, and I want to make sure I give time for any additions to what Keith just said. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he struck a chord with me as a communications person, um, where the, the why is so often lost. The other piece of it is that there, there's a lot of people who still don't understand how social media really exists within the context of, of politics these days. Um, you know, I'll get sent... Uh, a series of social media posts or, or replies that a council member was sent and say, hey, what do we do about this? And I'll go through 40 of them and you'll find that 32 of them aren't even from within the community. Um, and, and so it's we've reached a point where you're actually not even operating within your own jurisdiction. I mean, we're not within your own jurisdiction, you're within your own boundaries anymore. Um, so it's just not, it's not necessary the way it used to be. So the why becomes even more important of, you know, is this actually going to have the intended impact that, that we're hoping for? Um, the, the mention of uh, personal accounts was, was a, an interesting one to me, just because as soon as you're elected, you lose that personal account, really. Um, a lot of council members will put, hey, opinions are my own in their Twitter bio, and then think they can say whatever they want. You're an elected official always for the entirety of your term. So tweet accordingly. Malcolm, Very last word on this before I switch up. Yeah, I just don't have anything to really to add. Uh, I appreciate the, the comments that uh, both uh, other panelists have, have made here. Uh, really important topic, though, just how we communicate and uh, what communication is all about. So I appreciate it being a, uh, an important question as part of the building trust with your community. So I want to stick with you, Malcolm, here for a second. And I want to talk about trust and what it means to residents. Because if you go talk to community members, the first thing they say to me when I ask them what trust is, they talk about transparency. They want more transparency from their local officials. They want more accountability from their local officials. And I want to know from you, Malcolm, and then we'll throw to Keith and then Ben, how can local governments be more transparent when you can inundate them with every single information you have but you will be still accused of not going far enough and being accountable. So for municipal leaders who are out there listening to this, what is the next step to being more transparent in a transparent world where everything is at the touch of your fingertips? Well, I, I, there's two parts to this or two parts I'd like to comment on. Uh, one, I'm an old teacher, and I, I, I always love that uh, primary school show and tell thing. And I think we, uh, we do a lot of telling, but we don't do a lot of showing. You know, and I remember in our, our community, uh, when we began to have conversations in the community about uh, we're digging up your street, a block here, we're replacing the water line. It costs this much money to dig it up and replace that water line. And by the way, here's what we're pulling out of the ground. Uh, you know, this is what it looks like. This is what it is. Uh, and then we're going to fill that hole back in with new pipe, and uh, we're we're and then we're going to have to come along and pave it. 
And this is what each of those different steps cost. And people are absolutely astounded at how much it costs to dig up dirt and replace dirt. But the show and tell piece, I, I mean, we can inundate them with information, uh, but I think we need to uh, really focus on the things that affect people's lives in our community, like we're digging up your street. And we got a lot of these to dig up, you know, and the asset management thing has, has helped a lot. The second part I would say is that one of the things I heard very early as a counselor and early in my days as mayor is what's the plan? Okay, what's the plan for fixing these roads? What's the plan for getting those ball diamonds in better shape? What's the plan? And you know what? I didn't have one. I didn't have an answer to that question. So you, as, as members of council, we throw up these things like, well, we'll see what the budget allows, you know, which is a non-answer. Or we'll blame it on the provincial government. We don't get enough money. Or we'll blame it on the last council that they should have done this, not us. But, you know, there's an, uh, there's an absence of planning. Uh, and I, I just really believe that's one of the steps to build trust uh, is, is to have some really solid plans in place. Part of it is not just asset management planning, but planning for the growth and development of your community, strategic planning, uh, planning for, you know, having a vision for your community and, and how we're going to get there. And, and then having that plan as a basis for conversations with people. You know, I remember an old fellow in my community, potholes on his street, he kept complaining to me. I, I said, I don't know when we're going to dig up your street. When we finally had a plan in place, I was able to go to him and say, look, we're digging your street up three years from now. <laughs> it's on the list. He was happy to hear that. Not happy that it was going to be three years, but at least I had an answer for him and, and had some good information and a better conversation with him about it. So those are a couple of things I would throw out that I think uh, councils need to do more of the show and tell uh, type of thing so that people really know what we're doing and what we're spending money on. And secondly, there has to be a, a, a good ongoing planning process. So unfortunately, I did say we're going to throw to Keith next, then Ben, but due to a scheduling issue, Ben has to jump out here in five minutes. So I'm going to throw it to Ben here, his last word on this topic, and then we'll go to Keith. Uh, but Ben, what, what do you have to say about how to tra being more transparent and accountable work in the local government context of building trust? Yeah, I, I think that a, a part of it is that people don't fully understand what they're asking for when they use the word transparency and accountability. Um, it's become somewhat of a buzzword that's lost true meaning. In my conversations and from what I've seen, when they say transparency, they're actually talking about accessibility. They want to know what's going on and why, and they want to be able to find it easily. They want it put in front of their face um, because they, they, that's what they have time for. And so if council goes into in-camera meetings every single week, the, the common resident isn't going to understand that there's an actual procedure behind that and there's a reason for in-camera meetings. They're going to look at that and go, oh, there's decisions being made behind closed doors. So you have to put the information in front of them in a way that they understand what's going on. That transparency to me, um, a lot of it goes back to municipal communications, um, it, not just from elected officials, but from the organization to say, you know, again, exactly what, what Malcolm was saying here's our plan for this road and here's why that's our plan. Um, when it comes to budgeting, it's very hard for regular residents to wrap their head around a full operating budget for a municipality. So if they can't see where their money's going and they can't interpret it immediately, then it doesn't make sense to them and the, the, to them that's a lack of transparency. So you have to put things in real dollars. You can't say we're doing a 4.9% tax increase without saying this is the actual dollar hit that it's going to have on our residents on a monthly or annual basis. Um, different pieces like that. We always go back to, uh, I, I've actually been using Hockey Canada as an example, where they were criticized because each of them got a $3,500 ring when they weren't criticized for X amount of dollars that could have been erroneously spent on a, a hotel room. Um, and, and it was the same, if you remember Bev Oda, it was the $17 glass of orange juice that did her in, not the inappropriate spending around that, because the $17 glass of orange juice is the one that people comprehend. And so you have to put it in real dollars that, and it's just about accessibility and transparency in this way just means that 
we're giving them information they can wrap their head around and they understand what government is actually doing. Keith, last word on you. If you have, if you can do it in two minutes, great. If not, then we'll oh, let I Ben. Can, I can do it in two minutes and we'll get Ben one more. And I just have a couple of things to add. First of all, council, uh, I mean, transparency and accountability are pretty simple concepts when you come right down to it. Accountability is doing what you said you were going to do. And transparency is being able to prove you did it, why you did it, how you did it, how much it cost. So for me, uh, being more transparent and accountable to constituents involves three things. First of all, what are your legal responsibilities? The legislation in every municip in, in every province across the country has, there are certain requirements with respect to accountability and transparency. Second of all, what does accountability and transparency mean to our community? Because it's not the same in every community. Saskatoon residents expect a different level of accountability than what Humboldt does, than the same thing as the arm of Lake Johnson. And the third thing is, what are your colleagues doing? I think that uh, a lot of learning can be done just probably looking around and being familiar with what other si like-sized communities or like-situation communities are doing with respect to uh, communicating with their residents. Because you don't want you don't necessarily want to always be out uh, ahead of the parade, you know, uh, banging the drum. But you certainly don't want to be the guy sweeping up the sweeping up the leavings up behind the parade either. You want to be somewhere that they're firmly in the middle. I want to go back to the accountability and transparency part for a second here. And I want to stick on it a little bit because as someone who's worked in municipal governments in the back end and the administration side of it, the one thing I heard in my role as communications uh, for a town was I can't trust that my politician is making the best interest for the entire community and not just themselves. There always seems it always seems that their road is being paved in front of their house. Their potholes are being fixed in front of their house. But it goes back to that asset management part as well. Malcolm, you're nodding your head here. So I'm going to start with you. How can local elected leaders ensure that the decisions that they're making is in the best interest of the entire community without being accused or the assumption that they're only in it for themselves and they're only bettering their part of the community and not the entire community. Yeah. Um, I, I think it <laughs> goes back to earlier points that were made about you earn that trust and confidence uh, uh, all the time, every day, every meeting, and uh, every opportunity you have in the community. And, uh, uh, you know, the transparency piece is really important. I, I think sometimes, and, and I certainly saw this in my community, and I've seen it in others, uh, well, this is the way we've always done it, you know. Uh, ha having a radio station sitting at your meeting and reporting the next day on the radio on the meeting, having the newspaper sitting there. Uh, now, because of some changes in the world of media, especially in smaller communities around the province, we're not getting that, uh, you know, that media coverage that we used to. And I think it's very important. So uh, council has a role to connect with media. In a, in a respectful and uh, in a way that's not manipulative, that provide, provides them with a lot of information to share uh, with the community. I've seen lately some really outstanding small communities are publishing newsletters about all kinds of things that are going on in their community and uh, going on with their council. Uh, so I think all of those tools have to come into play. And uh, it, it's not a one-off. It's not like you get your uh, report card once a year. Uh, you, you've got to be working on this all, all the time. And, uh, you know, the transparency piece, I go back to my show and tell thing. There are many, many, many examples of how we can show the community and tell the community what's going on. Uh, one of the things that I, I you know, we're, we're doing a, a new OCP plan. How do we get that in front of the community? Well, one of the best places to do it is on Saturday night at a hockey game in the lobby. Why not put that information there? Why not have people there who are talking about it, handing out information about it? There's, you know, we have to find creative ways to get out in the community and, and, and share information and engage with people. And I think that really... Uh, really helps with the transparency piece. And the, the final point I made, I think we need to talk about progress and achievements 
and not be shy about that. But we also have to talk about the issues and the challenges, you know, and, and asset management work is helping us put that in front of our communities in a way that we never ever could before. Uh, that these are some real concerns and financial issues that we have in front of us. And that's why we have to look at what are our core services, what are the priorities, what are the, what are the, the themes that we need to work on in the next few years. So uh, really important stuff. And the, and the question you're asking is, is a critical question, I think, for communities big and small. I want to add three points to that, Chris. Sorry to interrupt you. I was uh, I thought we'd lag there for a moment. There's three things I want to add to Malcolm's very appropriate points on this. First of all, one of the ways to uh, avoid this sort of, you know, they're only in it for themselves, rigorous attention paid to role and your lane. So many councils uh, fall into the trap of, and it's a natural thing. We're all, you know, many of us are type A personalities. We want to get in there. We're either because of our professional or our background or our interest or our training. We are, we are, we are more in tune with some parts of the operation than others. And I see many, many councils who will spend, who will spend hours of time debating the mo the smallest points, and 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 then forget the big picture. Uh, so rigorous attention to your role uh, in terms of establishing policy versus uh, being there on the operational side. And the concept of having your eyes in and your nose or your fingers out. So if, if councils maintain that strict adherence to what their role is, where they appropriately and properly spend their time, they, spend, they have less of a chance of getting trapped in this. Second thing is the internal versus external. You know, a tidy house is a good place to go home to, and it's a good place to be from. So transparency and accountability begin at home. And uh, if you don't have your own shop in order, you can't expect anybody to trust you to, to have the, you know, if your internal processes aren't good, your external processes probably aren't going to be either. And the last point I want to make on this is, and so many councils I see get into trouble with this, is uh, not understanding and not correctly applying the legislative rules and the common law law uh, and the common law requirements around conflict of interest. Uh, and and it's it's because we all want to be perceived as trustworthy. We think we are, and we think we're acting, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, the appearance of a conflict of interest can be even worse than an actual one. And uh, there's not enough attention paid to making sure that they are spot on with all of those, uh, with all of those aspects. Yeah, can I follow up uh, to just- I love uh, when people follow up. It makes my job a lot easier as host. <laughs> well, you know, uh, just uh, some, Important stuff comes to mind, uh, building on uh, Keith's comments. And uh, one of the things that we don't do, but it's recognized in several governance, good governance, best practices type of program for boards and organizations is doing a bit of a, a, a board evaluation process. And we did a bit of this in my time as council, and I think councils need to do more of this, where sometimes you actually step back and you say, okay, how are we doing as a council? Uh, you know, how is everybody feeling? Going around the table, maybe using some of the instruments that are available, is everybody feeling like they're getting their views uh, uh, across? Are, are people being respectful of each other? How are we communicating? How, what's our, how do we feel our level of transparency is? I think sometimes councils need to step back and really talk about how they function as a council. And that's where you get into that. What's our relationship with our, our, our chief executive officer here? What's our, what's our relationships with each other? Uh, you know, is our governance as effective as it should? What's our decision making? Uh, are we are we in our proper lane, or are we starting to get into that operational world? All of those kind of questions come up through that kind of a process, and and I think this just is part of uh, councils that, uh, whether it's through their initial orientation which isn't enough, there needs to be an ongoing educational program, uh, I believe for councils in, in the world of governance, there are many, many topics that you can bring to the council uh, um, that are a learning, uh, a learning activity for council. And I, I think this sort of uh, board evaluation or council evaluation process is a good example. 
I, I want to, uh, this next question comes from my conversations I've had with mayors, councillors, and Reeves from across Canada. And during my interviews with them, I ask one question. I ask, what is their biggest priority that they believe, in their opinion, is affecting their community? And they'll give me whatever they believe is the biggest issue. And then I turn the tables on them. And I say, if I go ask 100 people in your community what the biggest issue is, they always say something different than what their priority is. So I want to know from both of you, starting with Keith, how can local governments ensure that the priorities and actions align with what community wants in building that trust that we so desperately need? Because residents or community members may believe that what council is doing is not actually what we want them to do and they're not actually hearing what we're doing and i know it goes back to that actually accountability aspect but go in a little bit more in depth about what should councils be doing or local elected leaders be doing to ensure that what they're hearing or what their community's priorities are are actually being addressed at council keith start with you well, it all to me, it all comes down to understanding and um, understanding and and embracing uh, that which the community feels is important. Uh, the, the The trouble with that, though, is that many times uh, citizens, for uh, only because they are not as familiar with the operations of the municipality as as the elected and the and the appointed officials might be, is that they think they want something, but they really need something else. You know, um, Henry Ford had, you know, the uh, if he'd listened to his customers, uh, all, in their opinion, all they really needed was faster horses, right? They didn't need vehicles. He had to take it on faith that he had this right idea and that his vision was the right one. And gee, you know what? It's kind of turned out okay for the Ford Motor Company and for a whole bunch of others. Yet, so there is this element of, I hear you, I understand what your priorities are, but you may not have a fulsome understanding of the issues that we're facing in our community. And I'm going to have to do my best to not only articulate, identify those, but also articulate them to the community so that you get a more well-rounded version of truth, uh, for lack of a better term. Listen, this is something that's really concerning to me because uh, one of the statistics that we picked up before that SUMA presentation that you referenced, Chris, earlier in the earlier in our earlier in the program showed that 66% of Canadians believe that their senior levels of government, including local government in most cases, lie to them on a regular basis. If you've got two thirds of the population that think you're lying to them, how does that change the nature of your conversation that you have to have with them with respect to trust and what your priorities are? It's a, it's a monumental task, but you know, like any good wall, it begins and is built a brick at a time. And so for me, it all comes down to performance, uh, accountability, good governance and understanding what your role is and making sure that you have uh, paid scrupulous attention to all of the ethical and and uh, behavioral uh, characteristics and qualities that you need to have as an elected person. It's funny because two thirds of the population don't trust po politicians, but only a third of the population votes. So <laughs> If that tells you something, uh, I'm not sure what it, <laughs> it does, but Malcolm, the whole, go ahead. This go whole ahead. discussion, sorry, Malcolm, uh, this whole discussion is fraught with inconsistencies like that. And, and I think maybe more than anything else, it just points to the fact that we haven't paid enough attention to it. We don't really understand it very well. And that if we spent some time actually kind of drilling down into it and talking to people, not only people that, you know, that the 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 eighty five percent of the reasonably people in the world, but you know you've got the the you've got the extreme right and the extreme left, and more and more municipal governments are getting caught up in these you know the conspiracy theory of the day, and having a, a major implications to what their uh, what their engagement and consultation processes are, and it really can disrupt activity. So you know I mean suffice to say that. Uh, uh, you know, you can't you can't manage what you don't measure, and you and you can't be effective if you don't understand the uh, the game and the rules. Good, good points. Uh, so one of the things uh, about elections that is really neat is as you, as you as you hear from the community during an election period, uh, you hear a lot of things 
about what the community feels or thinks are, are important. And often people who are running for council uh, pick up on those things. And, and it's always, always good. Every election period that I went through, I always had an opportunity once we got together with council and say, what were we hearing? What were we all hearing? Were we hearing the same things out there or different things? But this all leads to that, how do we engage with the community and what's the effective way to do that? And there are many, many ways to do it and, and uh, different opportunities. And I think councils need to have a constant process uh, as individual councillors and as a council to engage with their community. I think it's a very important part of the job. You can't just leave it to the election period and you can't just do it once in a while. It's something we, uh, it's part of the job to do on and on. And a couple of interesting things, I think. One, where we need to appear that we're listening. Uh, we need to appear that we've heard people. And we need to appear that we are learning from that process and considering the learning in order to uh, build our policy, make our decisions. And good decisions always come from lots of good information. And, and I, I think that's one of the important pieces. We really, really have to know our community. And as Keith has alluded to, sometimes you get out there in the community <laughs> And what we're hearing is healthcare is the biggest issue in our community. Healthcare is the biggest issues uh, in our community or education is an issue. Uh, well, those aren't our issues. And yet at the same time, they are our issues. This is a struggle I think councils have. We are interested in those things, but we're not responsible for those things. So we have to engage in those things carefully and not over promise or create expectations that we can't deliver. Uh, so that, that's part of the very cautious part of, of community engagement is, is not getting into, uh, out of our lane, out of our business of uh, running a municipality and into the education world or the health world or, or, or those kind of topics. I think they take us off, off course and I think they create some false expectations around uh, uh, what municipal councils can and should be doing. Uh, so I, I think it's all part of the ongoing process. And I would, I would end finally with my, uh, my, my plug back to the planning process. And the, any planning process that a municipal council engages in has to have a major component of engaging with the community. And if they've done that well, and they've done it over a period of time, and they've reached out to all the groups and organizations and, and, and diverse parts of their community, uh, the chances are they have a pretty good focus on what the priorities of the community are, and then can begin to work from, from, uh, from that, that plan and those priorities. So I have two last questions for both of you before we wrap up here. And I want to start with something that you both just mentioned, but I'm going to spin it a little bit. Local elected leaders want the best for their communities. They want the best for everyone in their community, but local elected leaders know that they're not going to help every single member of their community. And if they don't know that yet, they should. You're never going to please 100% of the population of your community. On that note, how do you work in a community where you're not going to impress 100% of the people and you're not going to earn the trust of 100% of the people? Because there's always going to be that one person in your community who says, I don't trust a politician. I don't think it's a big secret but it's in every community, whether it be Humboldt, whether it be Edmonton, Regina, Calgary, anywhere across this country, you're not going to impress or tr get the trust of 100% of the people. So how do local elected leaders work in that situation where they, they have to realize that they're not going to earn the trust of 100% of the people, no matter what they do or what they say? Malcolm, you want to take that? We'll end with Keith on that one. Sure, tough one, tough one. Uh, how, how do you function in that realm? Uh, I, you know, you've got to have some thick skin, <laughs> a, bit, a bit courageous. Uh, 
you know, I, I certainly walked into meetings and situations and uh, with individuals and groups where, where I knew I was not the most popular person in, in the room. Um, but, you know, I have uh, some pretty, uh, a pretty good, I felt I had a, a really solid foundation of uh, some knowledge, some experience, some beliefs, uh, and some abilities that, uh, that I felt uh, I could uh, move the community in, in a direction that the community generally wanted to uh, move. And uh, not everybody agreed and not everybody was a fan, that's, that's for sure. Uh, but I think you have to build that foundation uh, as an individual, councillor, mayor, uh, Reeve, and, uh, and as a council. And if you're functioning well as a council, and you've done some really good community engagement and you have set uh, uh, some plans in place and have a focus for that uh, achieving that vision through some goals and objectives that you want and you can show the progress and you can look down the road at the future uh, at where you want to end up i i think then uh, you know that's the only way you can function in that environment and uh, i think that's true um, small communities, big communities. Uh, uh, that's the only way I see it. It's you have to be really strong in your beliefs and your in yourself and in your council and in your community uh, to move forward. And the other thing, sometimes you, you got to go out and find your fans and uh, <laughs> uh, make sure they're cheering you on. Keith, what about yourself? How do you how do you earn the trust of 100% of the people when 100% of the people will not trust you? I think I, I think the premise of your question is incorrect, uh, Chris. I I don't think I would ever worry about having a, uh, the support of 100% of the people. Think of I, I'd think like of to introduce you to life. some politicians. Then I apologize <laughs> to interrupt, but there's a lot of people I talk to who say that they have the the pulse of their entire community and they they have the backing of their entire community. Well, they might have the pulse, but I would suggest <laughs> that they are probably mistaken if they think they have the backing, and 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 that's okay. Right. I think part of this, part of reconciling and having that, you know, developing that, whether you call it the, you know, the Teflon exterior that Malcolm referred to, or the, uh, I, I refer to it as having the strength of your convictions is a key, right? And, and that needs to be based on good information and solid decision making processes. I mean, you have to know in your own heart, that what your council has decided is, is, is balanced, it's correct, it's made with the, you know, you've used the best decision, the best information and the best decision making processes that you possibly possibly could have. The other thing that I think we all get wrapped up in is it, and don't let perfect be the enemy of very good. I, how many times did you, how many times have any of us ever come home from high school or from university and get a hundred percent in something? You know, I came in with an 80 occasionally and I was like, it was the, it was a celebration at our house. You know, 80% was fantastic. And uh, the other quote I want to give is from uh, John Wooden, who's a great uh, basketball coach, uh, uh, a former basketball coach in, in the United States. He said, never let what you can't do stop you from what you can do. And I think there's a real, there's some real wisdom in there that, you know, you keep on moving ahead and whether you use the waves on the beach as an analogy or the, you know, the, the one step at a time, every brick in the wall makes the wall a little, a little bigger and a little more sturdy. Whatever metaphor you want to use, uh, it's this notion of continuous progress and continuous improvement is there. And one last thing that I'll just share, and it's maybe, you know, it's only tangentially related here, I guess, but I wanted to get it into the conversation. Long, many years ago, when I was taking my uh, change management certification work, uh, the instructor told us that, you know, anytime you do a change process, doesn't matter the size of the organization, whether it's a municipality or, or a government ministry or whatever, you're going to have about 60% of the people that are going to say, yeah, you know what, that sounds reasonable to me, that, that sounds like it's probably got some potential go ahead and and you know i'm with you then you're going to have about 20 to 30 percent of the people who are, are going to need some convincing are going to be the the skeptics are going to be the people that scratch their heads and say i don't know that doesn't you know that doesn't really pass the sniff test with me so those are the ones you're going to have to work on there's going to be 10 or 10 or 15 percent of the people that it doesn't matter what you do you know, they won't be satisfied. And I think it's just counterproductive to beat your head against that wall. And uh, because quite often that same 10 and 15% that don't agree with you on one thing are going to be totally behind you on another. Uh, 
So it's not the same 10 to 15% all the time. And the other thing is there are three, three reasons why people didn't like the changes that we were, that we were uh, proposing. One is that they just don't like change. Like people just don't like change. The second thing is that they don't like the change that you're proposing, which is a different thing than just not liking change. And the third thing is the reason is because they don't like you. And I think it, it's, it's just not productive and it's, and it's not reasonable to think that we're going to get to 100% of the people 100% of the time. So a little side story. Uh, when I was first elected mayor, I had an old uh, gentleman in the community. He'd been on the council in Humboldt. And uh, he, he said, uh, uh, well, Malcolm, for your first turn, term, uh, you're going to get half the people in the community mad at you. But don't worry about that, because in your second term, they'll have forgot, and the other half will be mad at you. <laughs> And so at any given time, you'll have half the community mad at you. Uh, but he, he said it tongue in cheek and et cetera, but it, but it kind of always stuck with me. I, you know, one of the things that I found uh, really helpful and effective, and when I look back on it, we did it a lot, but probably could have done it more, is we had a lot of delegations come to council, you know, and, and the whole thing about delegations wasn't a, a question of, uh, they weren't coming to complain or cause problems. Uh, they were coming because we invited them often, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, let's have some regular meetings with the Chamber of Commerce and engage with their issues and their concerns and, and, and look for their advice and their help. Uh, let's engage with seniors. Let's en engage with the minor sports folks. Let's engage with some of the community uh, social services type of networks. Even though it's not our big area, we're interested. We want to know how can we support these folks, those kinds of things. So I found that engagement process with different groups and organizations in the community to really helpful in, in looking at how we can support them and how they can support us. And I used to tell the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you're not the official opposition, you're actually a partner. You are a partner with us in making this community a, a, a great place. Uh, so I found that a really effective process. So my last question, and it's to wrap up this entire conversation. And we all know that building trust does not come overnight. It takes time. It takes a lot of energy. And it's an ongoing uh, thing that you councils have to work on. But losing trust happens overnight. Losing trust of your community can happen with one small thing. So what advice would you give councils, councillors, mayors, Reeve right now that will help them in the long-term game of municipal governments to build, but also maintain the trust of their communities? Malcolm, let's start with you and then we'll end with Keith. Well, I'm going to go back to my, uh, my I think every, every council should be sitting down and uh, creating a strategic plan and working with that strategic plan and, and uh, not just putting it on the shelf, but engaging with that plan throughout their term. I, I think that's a very important foundation for, for any council and include it very importantly that's where you establish some uh, goals and objectives and protocols around the communication piece and the community engagement piece, which is so important. And secondly, that, that plan includes training and educational opportunities for you as a council and as individual council members. Very, very important. I think that's one of the pieces that, you know, we're ordinary people, all of a sudden, we're on, in this role and in this job, and we didn't take that course in high school that told us how to be a counselor. Uh, and, and so we need a, a big ongoing education piece. And part of that is about the things Keith has mentioned, good governance, good decision-making, uh, good community engagement, all of those pieces. So uh, to me, those, those are important pieces. And the other one, I think that communities want to see us uh, engaging in partnerships with other organizations and other municipalities and be engaged in 
what's in the best interest of our area, our district, our region. And uh, uh, sometimes I, you know, that's a natural thing. If you asked any people on Main Street of any town, is it a good idea to be working with others in partnership? Of course it is. Uh, so those would be some of the pieces I would contribute. Thank you, Malcolm. Keith, a final word to you. For me, there are five key elements and I'm, everybody that's ever taken a course from me knows that I've always, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of lists because I'm not a very particularly organized person as Malcolm well knows. And uh, so this is my list, all right? The five, five keys to success. One, high performance governance, be worthy of trust. Hold yourself to a high standard and make sure that that you develop the ability and the confidence within your council to call, to keep each other, to call each other out if necessary, and to, and to, again, as I said, be worthy of that trust. The second one is something that Malcolm spoke to eloquently already, and, and that is well-coordinated well municipal planning. There is nothing more embarrassing to either a civil servant or an elected politician to not have an answer. And and I think that if we pay enough attention to the uh, to having robust planning processes and and well communicated and well trained staff, that we will have most of the answers that we need. Third thing is communications, engagement, accountability, and transparency with a purpose. And I said with a purpose, with a little bit of an exclamation mark at the end of it, because of our earlier conversation around making sure that you know what it is that you're going to communicate and why. The fourth one is resilient and sustainable infrastructure. One of the things that I think most councils can uh, get behind is this notion of, uh, yeah, we're not just in it for our term, we're in it for the long term. Like we're, our, our, we're talking decades and maybe centuries with respect to our community. We don't work in four year cycles. Even though I may only be here for four years, our processes are about sustainability and resilience. And that's how I think how that community members can take heart that it, that there is a that there's a larger movement at foot here. And the last thing is something that you spoke to, Chris, and we've tried to nibble around the edges, uh, and that is the whole notion of supporting public service opportunities. Uh, many councils have been have started to introduce a youth member on their council to get better engaged with the with younger people. The use of committees and focus groups and and uh, Malcolm's reference to to inviting delegations or paying attention to that uh, part of council's responsibilities, formal opportunities for, uh, to, for communication with the movers and shakers in your community to show that not only are you interested in what's going on inside your own little ivory tower, but you want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to, to, help, you, you know, to help you build it. So those are the five key elements of success for me. And, um, you know, as you said, it's a, it is a, a uh, journey and not a destination, and um, it just takes it takes co coordinated effort over a long period of time. Thank you so much, both of you, for doing this today, sitting down and having this great conversation. I feel like we've just only scratched the surface on the issue of trust in government, and maybe we'll have to bring you back on before Regina Summa 2024 and have this conversation a little bit more in depth with the regards of what's going on before the next uh, municipal election in Saskatchewan. So thank you both for sitting down and doing this. I once again want to thank Keith, Malcolm, and Ben for joining us on this special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. If you're able to, please, please consider making a show donation and it will help us grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. Also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for behind the scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes.
Thank you again for watching, and we'll be seeing you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. Remember, everyone, just keep talking.